Good afternoon, and welcome to our third NHLBI Small Biz Hangout. My name is Chris Asiella, and I'm a regulatory specialist at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. I work with investigators in the cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, and sleep disorder space to help them understand the regulatory framework and processes that surround biomedical investigations and technology development in the United States. These hangouts are an interactive way for me and my office to help provide this information. Today's hangout will focus on understanding how FDA classifies medical devices based on their potential risk profile and we'll also talk about how that classification impacts the FDA approach to regulating their release to the commercial market, either as exempt from review, subject to demonstration of substantial equivalence to predicate devices, or through thorough evaluation of their safety and efficacy attributes in a pre-market application. We'll pause at the end of each section of the presentation today to answer your questions. We ask that you please pose questions that relate to the content of the presentation rather than questions that relate to your specific technology, as we would likely need much more information about your innovation than should be provided in a public forum in order to answer your question. I would like to remind our YouTube viewers that you can post questions to my office's Twitter handle at NHLBI underscore SBIR or by using the hashtag SBIR chat. If you're participating through the Google Plus platform, you do have the option to post questions directly to the Hangout page, or you can also choose to submit them via Twitter. If you're watching this video as an archived event and have questions about its content, please, out, please reach out to either myself or today's presenter. Today's presenter is Ms. Laurie Weaver Huffman. I'm very happy and excited to welcome her to our Hangout today. Laurie is currently a Morocco Senior Director at Illumina. Illumina applies innovative technologies and revolutionary assays to the analysis of genetic variation and function. The Mor Morocco subsidiary continues to provide full consulting services to in vitro diagnostic, medical device, and companion diagnostic development companies, as well as fully supporting Illumina projects. Prior to joining Morocco in 2010, Laurie was the Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at Volcano Corporation, a cardiovascular diagnostic firm where she also served on the company's leadership team and assisted in taking the company public. At Volcano, Laurie was responsible for global regulatory activities covering the areas of Japan, Europe, Canada, the Asia Pacific, and Latin America. Her regulatory affairs and quality systems experience dates back to 1984. She's worked with medical device and pharmaceutical companies such as Volcano, Baxter Healthcare, and Alza, now a part of J&J. &J. As an independent regulatory and quality consultant, she's worked with many other companies, including Genentech, Medtronic, and the Sutter Institute for Medical Research. Lori has earned her European Regulatory Affairs Certification through the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society and is a California state and nationally licensed clinical laboratory scientist with the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. She earned her bachelor's degree with a, in microbiology with a minor in chemistry from Northern Arizona University and a master's of business administration with marketing emphasis from California State University, Sacramento. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much, Lori, for joining us today and hand over the presentation. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Chris and NHLBI, for the warm welcome and opportunity to participate in this Google Hangout. Today's agenda, we're going to go over device classification at a relatively high level. We'll move on to intended use statements and how that plays out in device classification. From there, we'll talk about some paths to market based upon those classifications, the different types of submissions required and then device uh, tools and requirements that you can use in the development of your device to meet those regulatory pathways. So starting with device classification, I start out this presentation with a link to an FDA uh, site here that goes into classification in, um, in detail. A major factor that FDA uses to determine um, device classification is risk. 
So if your device that you're developing presents any new risks for a device that's currently on the market, we've also known that to be called a predicate, then that is something they'll take into consideration on the class that it'll be. Also, whether your device is a tool or a treatment can impact the device, whether it's a high risk or a low risk device on how it's used. And then also, whereas an adjunct therapy to a diagnostic it's probably going to be a little lower risk because it's not as significant as a sole uh, treatment device, for example. Another key factor in determining device class is intended use. We will explore that a bit later in this presentation. Ideally, I'd like to say at this point that it's really worth spending a lot of time crafting the language around your intended use, as you'll see um, coming up with your initial submission you'd like to be more general in your intended use and as you proceed through your development then get into more specific um, intended uses and subsequent submissions. And here for example a general indication could be for example peripheral vasculature versus down the road you might list out specific vessels such as carotid vessels. There are three types of classifications that FDA uses, and they go from class one is the lowest risk up to class three, which are the highest risk devices. Class one devices are not intended for use in supporting or sustaining life, and they may or may not present, present potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury to patients. That's a you know straight up definition out of you know the FDA guidance. Um, most other devices are going to be class two or three, um, and I would um, suggest that most people are going to be working on class two devices initially. I've made this little table here to help demonstrate um, devices that might be a moderate risk, likely class two, and then conversely devices that would fall into the high risk category, a likely class three. Most class two devices are going to have predicates on the market already. And if your device uh, is going to provide information that's not a sole diagnostic but a piece of a puzzle, you're likely at mod moderate risk and going to be a class 2 device. Conversely to that, on the right side, you'll see if your test provides information that is sole diagnostic, it's telling whether your patient has a disease or not, that's a higher, higher risk scenario and likely a class 3. Um, relative to misuse of your device. If the misuse is a small chance of that happening or the misuse wouldn't create a serious situation, again, you're going to likely be a class 2 device. Conversely, if there's a high chance of misuse and that misuse could lead to significant um, injuries, you're likely going to be a class 3 device there. Um, devices that have been on the market for a very long time have a long history of safe use. Those have demonstrated to be at moderate risk, you're likely going to be class 3. And finally, the latest trend in medicine right now are uh, personalized medicine, and you might hear a lot about companion diagnostic. So those devices where information is telling a physician which drug to use or not use or how much to use, those currently are falling into the class three, the high risk um, categories. This graphic here is another way, again, of showing that risk stratification and how FDA is looking at these, starting at the bottom with the least risky, going towards the top with the most risky. Hopefully, as you read through here, you're starting to get a feel for how risk plays a factor in these classifications. At the bottom, we, I listed some class one devices, you know, some basic imaging, introducers, stethoscope, for example. In the center, some class two devices. You'll see your PTCA catheters because they're invasive. You've got digital blood pressure monitors and respiratory monitors. And then finally, at the top, some class three devices, vascular graphs, pacemakers, et cetera. And there's your um, companion diagnostics. So are there any questions on this information so far? So I am looking at both our Twitter feed and the Google Plus 
page. And at this point, Laurie, we do not have any questions. But I would like to remind our viewers that you can post questions at any point in time. Just type them onto the Google Hangout page or post them on Twitter, and we'll be sure to answer them either throughout the presentation or at the end. Thank you. OK, terrific. So we'll move on to intended use section of our talk today. So there's two definitions that FDA lays out here for intended use and a different one for indications. In reality, these two terms are used interchangeably. If you're looking at labeling of devices out on the market right now, sometimes you'll see two sections, one called intended use, one indications. Maybe you'll only see one called intended use or vice versa. Again, it's not necessarily what you call the section of your labeling. The point is the intent and the words that you're putting in there. So the general purpose of the device and its function, the disease or condition, the diagnosis, <clears throat> the way in which this device is going to be used, <clears throat> that's the information that FDA is looking at as far as how your um, device classification is going to fall and how this plays into the risk of your device. Um, and then taking that a step further, this is where I mentioned earlier to spend some time crafting your language um, for your intended use because it does impact the way FDA looks at your device. And you can craft it to fit, if you will, into a desired classification. If your initial intended use is somewhat general, again, my example with the blood vessels, you just say vessel and leave it general like that. Again, that's probably a lower risk classification. If you become more specific in the next example where you're speaking of carotid arteries, depending on where that's used um, in the clinical setting, that could be considered high risk because it's an artery, it's a carotid, it potentially could fall into a class three. Um, but again, this is where I'm hoping you can see the, the words you choose in your intended use can really drive that classification. The statement that you use um, does have specific things you want to include, you know, the indications, the clinical setting, target population, etc. Um, FDA has a nice um, how to craft um, your intended use on their website. But again, keeping it general is um, ideal for your initial um, applications. Um, Another thing that gets easily overlooked is your marketing literature. FDA will consider the way that you're marketing and talking about your device as indications. For example, you could have your label that says, I have a scalpel that's intended to cut tissue. But then when you're out there talking about your device and marketing it, you start talking about it's used for making incisions in the cornea. And FDA will take that information in consideration. And again, you're starting to become more specific and perhaps could end up in a higher risk um, situation. Again, FDA does spend a lot of time on discussing this. They've um, crafted this levels of specificity, which is a qualitative ranking of proposed indications. On this slide, um, the topic is for diagnostic devices. And they have this ranking listed here of you know, four incremental um, elements that increase the specificity as you go down the list. So initially, if your indication is just talking about a physical parameter, then you add in a target population, then you add in your clinical use, and then ultimately the most specific scenario where you're talking about clinical outcomes in this case. Here's a similar scenario that FDA has regarding if your device is a therapeutic device. Again, generally, the most general scenario when you're just speaking a function, and then you increase your specificity as you go down this list, again, with clinical outcome language um, leading to the highest specific indication you could have. A lot was going on there, so I tried to pull up some examples <clears throat> from the existing products that are on the market to kind of show you how the words you choose 
and this general versus specific uh, language um, can play out in the real world with devices. These three examples I've listed here are um, falling into the diagnostic scenario that we had two slides ago. So here we have the first one with the Vesix um, catheter. Um, we have specifically use is for introduction of, the de of devices. And then we have the anatomical site being very specific renal arteries. The next device, the preview catheter, it's of a similar specificity, kind of moderate. You're talking about the um, anatomical location, the peripheral vasculature. You're talking about assessing discrete regions, but it's not specifying specific vessels, so it's a little more general than if you were to actually list the vessel there. And then it's also using the word adjunct, which again is a, a nice word to use to keep it at a lower risk um, category and in a more general um, scenario. Finally, the last example with the Nelcor respiratory monitor, um, we've added patient population to this intended use that the prior two didn't. Um, you'll see midway through the text here where it does talk about adult, pediatric, neonatal patients, as well as well or per poorly perfused um, patients. So again, just some examples of general versus more specific um, language you can use in crafting your um, indications for use and intended use. Okay, any questions or comments on this section? So yes, Lori, there, there actually is a question, and the question relates to a comment you made earlier in your presentation. Can you please explain what is a 510K de novo? Yes, I can. I'll, I'll, I'll be somewhat high level here, although types of submissions are definitely conducive to a whole nother hangout. Lots to talk there. A 510K de novo scenario is where there is not a predicate currently on the market, but you feel that the risk is moderate. And so the whole 510K paradigm requires that there be a predicate and you're showing substantial equivalence. But since there isn't, then it's out of that paradigm. They've created this de novo process that would allow you to get clearance as a moderate device 510K without a predicate. And usually the result of that type of situation will be what they call a special controls document, which is a good segue for later in my talk here. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but it is a way to get on the market as a moderate risk class two device. Well, excellent. Thank you for that very thorough answer. Let me check and see if we have any additional questions. It appears at this point that we have no more additional questions, so back to the presentation. Okay. Let me do that. Okay. So path to market. So once you know your classification of device, then you wonder what type of submission is going to be necessary. And we had that good question on de novo. That is definitely one of the options. So let's start at the beginning. If you have a class one device, you have no submission requirement. And there are also another set of devices called class two exempt. This link here to the access data site is a listing of all class two devices that are exempt. And I'll show you some examples shortly here that will help you see where FDA can specifically tell you uh, your class of device and whether you're exempt or not. Um, most devices are going to be class two, like I said, that do require a pre-market notification, also known as the 510K. Um, this guidance here, alternate approaches to demonstrating substantial equivalence in pre-market notification, that guidance document lists three types of submissions for the 510K, a traditional, an abbreviated, and a special. Again, I won't go into detail in this um, hangout about those three types of submissions. Um, 
it mostly has to do with content and then FDA's uh, review timeline requirements. Um, they have just hot off the press a few months ago issued a new guidance document that's replacing a much older one called Evaluating Substantial Equivalence. Um, this new guidance document, um, it specifies information that should be included in submissions. It does go into explanation of when clinical data may, may be required, which is an improvement from the earlier guidance. And there is a decision-making flowchart to help you um, walk through that application process. It intentionally does not go into the details about the abbreviated or special um, 510K routes. And that's because in the near future, we are expecting FDA to publish uh, two new guidance documents that specifically address the abbreviated and special process. Although in the meantime, you can go to this first guidance, the alternate approaches guidance that does go into some detail on those different types of submissions. And then finally, for your class three devices, you are going to have to follow the pre-market approval application process, the PMA, the dreaded term PMA that people hear about, um, again, if you're a class three device. I didn't list the de novo in here, um, but we, we did have to talk about it shortly, and that would be for a class two moderate risk device in that uh, number two section there. Okay, so as promised, here's an example of how some of this plays out in reality. So if you have a stethoscope and you have determined that your regulation, this 870.1875, it says right here on this page that your submission type is 510K exempt and that it is a class one device. Um, do read the notes when you are uh, going through this with your device. Um, there are um, limitations of exemptions that are listed here, and again, you can go and, and read those on your own if it applies to your specific device. But um, for the most part, the key is your class one, your 510K exempt. Here's an example of a class two device where it also is 510K exempt. And in this case, you'll see in the notes that there is a reference to special controls devices, and we'll, we'll talk about those controls shortly. Um, and again, but that link will take you to a list of class two devices that are exempt from the pre-market notification or 510K process. So now we'll take a different approach on looking at information. If you go back to your regulation number that you know, and in this case, we're showing 878.4040. And again, the classification is listed right on this page that I have um, outlined in red. So surgical apparel, it says it's a class two device with um, special controls for surgical gowns and masks. But do notice they also have listed Class 1 general controls, again, for surgical apparel, but it's other than gowns and masks. So here's a case where you have one regulation, one type of device, but there's two different um, classifications and two different um, requirements for um, submission that you can see here. So any questions on that information? before we move on to our development and, and tools for developing. So, yes, Laura, there actually are some questions, although they do refer back to the prior um, information that you presented, more so than the current okay. section. So the question is, and it's sort of a two-part question, I believe, why would you use a specific intended use statement if a general intended use statement can be used to cover all of the indications for use. The example showed some very detailed indica indications such as well or poorly perfused. Why would you go to the trouble of delineating all of that information? Okay, great question, great question. Um, there, there's multiple reasons that you could choose to do that. Um, one reason is your business goals and marketing goals. What is your target market? 
Um, if, if you want to be able to market to specific physicians, specific clinicians, you might need to have that specific detail in your language in order to penetrate that market and, and, and get there and have it used there. Um, another reason is, what have your competitors done? FDA doesn't really like different. They want you to be the same, if you will, to your predicate device, to your device you're comparing to that's already on the market. And so the more you can look the same, the easier sell it is, if you will, when you're actually doing that submission. Um, a third factor that can come into play is the type of testing and data necessary. If you are specific and call out a specific anatomical location, it's highly likely some of your bench testing will need to incorporate models that use those um, anatomical locations or, or different types. And that could be an advantage for you, to, like maybe a barrier to market entry of a competitor if you have gone to that trouble of doing that additional work um, on your bench studies as well as perhaps your clinical testing. Um, at the end of the day, it does kind of come to a business decision. I always recommend get your first clearance being general if you can just to get on the market and then future submissions you can play off of your own device as your predicate and start building on it. Then FDA has that learning, that understanding and you can move forward more easily that way. That was excellent. Can you also discuss a little bit how your relationship with a reviewer or a review team might evolve over the life cycle of a medical device? Terrific, yes, good question. Um, nowadays the environment is such that FDA, they've always said as long as I've been in this, you know, come early, come often. They want to hear, hear from you. And so they, they're really wrapping their arms around that now with much more clear guidelines on how to get through that process. So before you do your initial submission, you'd have a pre-submission with FDA and you'd, you'd be in front of them. Usually that initial reviewer who gets that assigned your pre-submission package, if you then subsequently do a 510K, they try to have that same reviewer and review team on that 510K review team. Subsequent pre-submissions as you go to your next phase, again, in the documentation you list your history numbers. Every pre-submission is given a Q number and obviously your 510K has a K number. So you include that information when you're doing subsequent pre-submissions and 510Ks, etc. And they have that linked to the prior reviewers. They do try to keep continuity across your device all the time. It doesn't always happen. Um, everything is in the record though, so if your reviewer should, should switch, they do have access to that prior information. But, um, but that's how you, you start building that relationship before your first device ever hits um, the FDA. And then, again, it's a relationship with the same reviewer and team as you move forward to all your iterations of your device. No, that, that's great. Thanks so much. Uh, that's all we have for questions right now, so let's return to our scheduled hangout. Uh, okay. We'll keep hanging out. Okay. So device class requirements and tools. Okay, so we just talked about types of submissions according to your classification and regulation number. And now we're going to get in to see how we're going to start building our development plans and actually developing the data that is going to be necessary to put into these various submission types. So there's two types of controls. I think we saw in earlier slides. There's general controls and special controls. General controls apply to all medical devices. And those are just basic provisions that FDA has. Um, it's their regulatory means to ensure that devices are safe and effective um, on the market. Special controls are device or device category specific. And they are developed as automatic class three designation devices, which again, topic for another hangout. And also we talked previously, they come 
out also from the de novo process. Um, and then one other little interesting thing to whet your appetite for future um, hangouts, special controls does allow you to go through the abbreviated 510k process. And again, we'll, we'll save that one for future. The general controls are listed here. They're on the FDA website. Again, these are mechanisms FDA has to ensure devices are safe and effective on the market. The only ones I'll specifically mention are device registration and listing. Even if you're a class one device, you will be registering and listing your device on the FDA website. So FDA has visibility to what is out on the market. And then also the last one I'll uh, mention are good manufacturing practices, also known as the QSR, quality system regulation. Again, all devices, no matter the class, have to follow those. And again, another topic for a future hangout are uh, GMPs. Special controls, like I said, they're um, listed, if you recall, on that one page for that particular device. It did say that there were special controls for it. Here I pulled one out as an example um, for um, PTCA catheters. Here's the link for it. Just to show you and help you appreciate the detail of these uh, controls documents, are here are some of the elements off the table of contents of this specific guidance. And you can see it goes from biocomp testing, content and format of the test data. It has specific performance testing requirements that it lists in the controls document. It goes through animal testing, clinical testing, sterilization, shelf life, and labeling. So they're very uh, thorough and complete uh, controls documents that pretty much can guide you through the development and testing of your device so that when you do get in front of the FDA, you've got um, information that's going to meet their expectations. I wanted to show you a little bit about biocompatibility, again, just to see how does this actually play out in what do I test my device, where do I start. Um, the guidance or the standard that everyone's using and FDA recognizes for biocompatibility is ISO 10993. And you'll see in this document that it first starts out by listing the nature of the body contact. So here you see there's three methods of contact of a device. One is surface contacting, one is external communication, and the one are implant devices. Inside of each of those are subcategories. So with surface contacting, you can be on the skin, completely external. It can be mucosal membranes, such as, you know, your eye, um, endotracheals, you know, et cetera, wherever there's mucousy membranes, and then breached or compromised services, um, surfaces where you've had cuts and abrasions and whatnot, and et cetera. I won't read these to you. You can see that each um, body contact area has um, categories inside of that. The next step after your contact location and type, then you're looking at duration. How long is your device in contact with this uh, body part? And um, here we have limited exposure. It could be a single use, or it could be multiple times up to 24 hours. There's prolonged exposure, which is 25 hours, but less than 30 days. And then the last one they consider permanent, even if it's not permanent, if it's more than 30 days, it still has the same requirements as a, you know, per se permanent device. So then how does all this come together? They have this wonderful table in the um, standard that kind of shows you then the testing that is required. So let's pick a, an intubation device. Let's say that on the left, the category will say that that is a surface contacting device. We know that it's mucosal because you're going in your um, esophagus, so that would be the center, this mucosal membrane. And then the third column is your contact duration. Typically, an intubation device, let's say it's used in, um, on, you know, uh, in an ER, we'll say it's less than 24 hours, so it has limited exposure, that would be your letter A. And then if you read across, then you have the testing that is required to demonstrate 
biocompatibility. So you look where the X's are. So for a surface device of mucosal membrane with limited contact, less than 24 hours, you're required to do cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation of intra or in <laughs> intracutaneous reactivity. Whew. Um, taking that same device, but let's say it's, it's greater than 30 days, letter C, you would have to do those same three tests, but additionally, you'd have to do subacute and subchronic toxicity as well as the genotoxicity. So again, this is just a, a wonderful table that kind of steps you through your device uh, biocompatibility requirements. And the standard does define the test methods that are necessary for all these biological effects that are on the far right section. Um, and then any test lab that you're sending your devices out to, if they're certified in this ISO testing, they're certainly going to know um, how to do this and how to write the reports that FDA is familiar with seeing and, and be acceptable for your submission. So another source of information to help you in the development of your device and creating these uh, test information that needs to go inside your submission um, are standards. And the biocompatibility standard is one that we just went over at, at length, <laughs> at some length. Um, there are two types of standards in FDA's eyes. Some are recognized consensus standards, and then others are just consensus standards. Um, the only difference is FDA recognizes some and not others. Um, they are, most times you have to purchase them. They're usually a couple hundred dollars. Um, they standards are voluntary. FDA does not require that you follow them. However, if you do follow a recognized standard and that's, you know, demonstrated in your submission, in your reporting, there's going to be you know, FDA is not going to have any questions on the methods you used and whatnot. It's it's pretty straightforward. They just go straight to the data and whatnot. If you haven't followed a recognized standard, again, that's fine. You would just explain we use this these methods because and justify the rationale for the testing you did based on your particular device and its design. Some other examples um, that I've listed here that are extremely common, electrical safety testing through the IEC document, and then um, there's some radio frequency, some RF testing, again, very commonly uses this VSCN 55011 um, it, um, standards. And there's just a plethora of standards out there, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute how to find those. Um, the, the, Last source of information that can help you with developing uh, your device uh, testing are FDA guidance documents. Um, this link here, again, will give you just a whole laundry list of guidance documents available um, for various devices on the market or in development. Here's the search engine on the FDA website that will gets you to the consensus standards, those standards, those voluntary standards that FDA recognizes. Drop-down menus, it shows you all of them, ISO, EN, IEC, AMI, etc. What the most useful thing I'd recommend for you just starting out is you know your product classification, we just went through that, so you have a product code, it's the three-letter code, ITX, etc or perhaps you don't know that, but you have your regulation number. You can type it in this uh, uh, box in the center of the screen. I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but um, type that in there, and then it will, it will list out every FDA-recognized consensus standard that's applicable to um, your device's regulation number. Or again, if you know the code, the product code, you could put it there as well. And voila, here's an example of that. So here I knew my uh, regulation number was 892.1570. I, maybe I knew my product code ITX. Either way, you'll get the same page. Or it's, it's a you know, ultrasonic diagnostic. You can search by that also. 
And here's our list of recognized standards. Um, there's three, four, seven standards listed here that FDA recognizes. Again, these are purchasable. You are not required to follow these. These are voluntary. But again, you can see that FDA has an expectation of this type of uh, data in, in the submission that you're going to be doing. And then also what's nice on this page is it does list guidance documents. So there is one guidance document specific to this regulation number, 892-1570, and it's called Information for Manufacturers Seeking Marketing Clearance of Diagnostic Ultrasound System Introducers. They're not short in title. But um, again, just a, another great resource in um, development of your device and the type of information you'll need for your submission. So finally, we'll have some conclusions here from this talk. Um, so again, we start high level. The device classification, it's risk-based. Intended use and indications, the words you choose, definitely can influence that risk determination. Device class then determines the submission type, whether it's a exempt or a 510K or a pre-market approval application. All devices are going to follow general controls regardless of the device class. That's just a basic expectation. And um, there is many tools out there on your development path um, that can help you in um, designing the uh, tests and information that you're going to put into your submission. Those are special controls there are, that are available for specific devices and device categories. There's consensus standards available. And then again, there's FDA-specific guidelines that can be device-specific as well as, as generic. So that is all I had to talk about, but I am happy to answer more questions. I know that was a lot to take in. <laughs> yes, it was, but you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much, Laura. <clears throat> um, we actually do have a couple of questions, so okay. I'm going to start out by asking one that leads directly from what you were just talking about, and the question is, are there standards or guidance documents or guidelines for all types of testing that FDA might want to see in a device submission? There is not for everything out there, <laughs> unfortunately, but but there is a lot out there. So um, again, if you you know start with the consensus standard, the voluntary standards, you know what is out there that applies to your device. Um, again, with this new um, found communicative FDA that we have and wanting to do these pre-subs, I highly recommend come up with your development plan. We feel that these are the tests that are appropriate to demonstrate substantial equivalence. You can be fairly high level on the types of tests and maybe the models, your number of samples, what you're going to compare to, etc. and submit it in a precept and ask FDA, this is what we're thinking, this is why we feel this is appropriate based on our device design and our intended use and get their feedback. And they will give you feedback on um, you know, whether they feel it's sufficient or appropriate, they might have suggestions on something different. And remember, FDA is not a consultant. They will not consult or, you know, they will respond to questions you ask and give you feedback. But they feel you're the expert. It's your device. You designed it. So tell them what you think and why, and they'll give you feedback. Great, wonderful. And a follow-on question to that, one of our audience members wants to know, is there a best time to approach the FDA with a medical diagnostic device pre-submission, for instance, before or after a prototype is made, or even just in general? Should you target a few months before your submission or a year before your first product? What sort of guidelines might you uh, suggest to our audience members. Sure, sure. Um, if your device is very unique and new and novel, I would suggest the earlier the better. Again, treat it as an education opportunity to FDA. They, they are interested in technology and what's happening out there. So you could go with a fairly high level discussion with FDA and just give them your vision. This is our 
new cool thing. This is why. This is how we think it'll impact it. We have a three-step development process. Our first submission is going to be this very general use, and then our next one, etc. So that would be before you even come up with a prototype. Maybe it's when you just have the concept drawings and sketches. If you're a more, um, um, I want to say, Me Too device or something that's serving a market that's already served, but maybe a different way of doing it. I would still go in be you know after a prototype, but before you've done any of your hardcore testing, if you will. If if you're familiar with the QSR, you do it before your design freeze, before your initial verification test, just to talk with FDA your thoughts on verification testing, on what you're thinking of doing. Just before you invest the time and money into that testing, you want to make sure what you're doing is the best use of your time and, and money that'll result in information in your submission that'll that'll carry through. But definitely talk to them before you do testing that you think is going to go in your submission. Wonderful. And I actually have a follow-on question for that that I think our audience might want to hear an answer to, and that is, can you go to once you've had a pre-submission meeting with the Center for Devices, can you go back to that same reviewer or review team for clarification or for a second pre-submission meeting about that same target technology? Yeah, great question, and absolutely. They really encourage that. Every pre-submission, again, it'll get a Q number, and the first two digits are the year. So this year you're getting Q14, and then the other digits are consecutive. They'll close that interaction out with uh, minutes and they'll send you a note, this is closed. If you want clarifications or subsequent communication on it, then you submit a supplement. You use the same Q number and then you just say S001, supplement one, and then you submit that. And again, it, it ties all the documentation together, it tries to keep the review team together, and it just builds. And that's what you would do. These I've been involved in pre-submissions that have gone on for years, like three years, and we're still, we're, we're passing, we're out of our prototype phase, you know, now we're getting into, you know, our initial clinicals, and so yeah, that's how you do it by supplements. You can, there's no end in the number of supplements, but you want your questioning at each supplement to be relevant and pretty specific, so FDA's time is not wasted and it's fruitful and, and you're getting valuable feedback to move you to the next development step. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have another, we have several more questions. Hopefully you're not in any rush. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our next question is, how much supporting data is needed for a 510K versus a PMA submission? And what are sort of the basic timelines for those submissions, both for putting, you know, for submitting them, but also for hearing feedback from the agency? Okay. Ah, uh, yes, those are the hard questions. Um, it's the, the, the first thing you should do is research, for a 510K, research your predicates, your devices that you want to compare to. 510K summaries are available on the FDA website, and so look at those and see what testing they did and that will give you insight to the types of testing, it'll give you the end number like sample sizes, etc. Um, and remember with the 510K you're just proving substantial equivalence that you're the same or no worse than this other device that's on the market. When you're in the class 3 high risk, the pre-market approval scenario, you're having to actually demonstrate safety and efficacy. So the amount of data is increased from a substantial equivalence. The amount of increase, I can't tell you, that's very device specific. Again, you'll be having lots of conversation with FDA um, to find out, again, what are those end numbers, you know, what's the burden of proof and the type of proof um, that's necessary. Um, basic timelines, a 510K statutory, it's 90 days. There's tons of guidance that go through. There's so many different scenarios. There's administrator reviews and clock starting and stopping and 
what I tell people in your product development schedules, put in 120 days on your project schedule, your Gantt chart for a 510K, because it's going to take more than 90, so put in some buffer. A PMA, again, statutory is six months, 180 days, but I always say a year. Just plan on a year because there's lots of clock stops and all sorts of scenarios we won't get into. But um, So again, for the actual review process for a 510K, put 120 days on your calendar. For a PMA, put a year. Um, again, detail of content, you, you've got to talk to FDA and, and find out what that is. 510K, easy. Look through 510K summaries. There's a ton of them out there and just see what others have done and that'll give you a good gauge on what you might need to do. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, there is a question that someone has asked about whether there will be a PDF of the presentation slides and I would like to answer that because as a federal agency we would need to post things in an ADA compliant manner. That is not possible but if you reach out to me directly after this presentation I would be more than happy to share them individually with you as a audience participant. So um, that is the answer to that person's question. The next question that I would uh, that our audience has is: When would a software system be treated as a device? <laughs> um, software, just like any other device. If you're, you know, the definition of a medical device. If you're mitigating, curing, whatever that definition of medical device is, you, you are a medical device. Um, I know, catching me off guard, there are, it's a big hot topic software because it runs all of our devices pretty much. There's lots of applica or like phone apps and iPad apps. FDA's got guidance documents going on all over the place about that. Um, MDDS, Medical Data Device Storage, help me out with the name of that one, Chris. Um, <laughs> I just use MDDS too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a guidance document. It very nicely lays out scenarios where you need to get um, FDA clearance first, scenarios where um, what is the term? They're calling it a regulatory oversight. They're they're not requiring it to go through the agency because they're considering it a lower bar. Um, I think regulatory it, discretion. Regulatory discretion. That's the word. <laughs> um, yeah, I know MDDS. I bet if you go into the FDA website and type in MDDS, that document will will peer up, but it's uh, if, if your software, it's same definition for a medical device, if you're curing, mitigating, etc. Or an accessory to a device that does that. And a corollary guidance document that our audience members may want to also look at is the mobile medical apps mm. guidance. So it sort of goes hand in hand with the software development guidance document if that is the area in which you're working. Exactly, good point. Um, so there are two questions in here that I don't feel are appropriate for us to answer in this hangout. I'm going to mention the two questions just, just so that our audience knows that we're acknowledging them, but we are going to uh, talk in a minute about some potential hangout topics for 2016. So the questions are, does this type of um, information that you shared today also apply to the new guidance coming out for the uh, laboratory developed tests that most will be class 2 and also uh, request to explain the difference between CLIA and FDA regulations and because today's presentation is focused mostly on medical devices I feel that these questions although very pertinent and current uh, may relate better to a future hangout which will focus on the development of in vitro diagnostics and no doubt also lab developed tests because that is a very current topic. Even just today there was a House and Energy Committee meeting where uh, the director of CDRH was speaking about the proposed new laboratory developed test guidance document that is expected to be issued. So um, 
I'm looking and at this point that does cover all of the questions that were submitted. Do you have any final words of wisdom or guidance for our audience participants that you'd like to share today, Laurie? Um, I think in closing I would just say is just comb the FDA website, look at what others have done in those 510k summaries that are public on the website, and engage FDA. Don't be afraid to talk to them. That They, they will give you clear feedback um, through their pre-sub system. And go early, go often, to use FDA's term from the past. <laughs> Very wonderful. Thank you. And I would like to also just remind our audience that this is the third Hangout in our series. And the first two did cover both navigating the FDA website so you can find some of that information. And then these sort of first contact uh, aspects of interacting with the agency. So uh, to close out this first inaugural year of Regulatory Basics, Google Plus Hangouts, we will be having a Another Hangout on the 16th of December at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and that will be focused on an overview of both drug and biologics regulation. And the uh, URL for the Google Plus page is there on that slide. And we have a number of proposed topics for 2015, and those include a overview of in vitro diagnostics regulation, quality system regulations 101, identifying predicates, and an overview of orphan product development. Now, these are just proposed topics, not definite topics at this point in time. I absolutely welcome your suggestions for additional topics or more timely topics. Uh, this series exists to meet the needs of our NHLBI investigators and other small businesses and biomedical innovators in this space. I don't want to be too device heavy, so please help me identify some additional uh, drug and biologic related topics that are of current and uh, are of current interest. And then finally I would like to close out today's hangout by saying thank you so much for your attendance. These hangouts are organized and presented by the NHLBI Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. And if you are developing a product or a technology that fits within the NHLBI mission space, which covers cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, or sleep disorders and diseases, you may contact us through our website listed here for additional assistance and to find out about the SBIR and other funding opportunities that NIH does provide to our uh, investigators. And if you are developing a product or a technology that falls outside of NHLBI's mission space, you can please use the resources that are presented in this Hangout to um, reach out to the appropriate office at FDA or institute at NIH for additional assistance. And thank you again so very much. And thank you, Laurie, for such a wonderful and informative presentation. Thank you very much.